All right, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Let's get started. So we're, <clears throat> just wanna check in, <coughs> just wanna check in for a moment in terms of where we're at, where we've been and where we're going, okay? So we started out this whole cardiovascular section thinking about negative feedback and we've been keeping our eye on the mean arterial pressure prize since we've been working through all this, okay? Because that is, one of the regulated variables that the body cares about, okay? We've talked a lot about the effectors, okay? So this is where we've been sitting for the last while. We've been talking about, uh, we talked about the heart. <clears throat> so what, what did we have on that list? It was muscle and glands, right? That were effectors, and so the muscles that we've been talking about are uh, the heart, and a vascular smooth muscle, okay? So how we're gonna change heart function and how we're gonna change vascular smooth muscle cell function, vascular radius to affect mean arterial pressure. So you've got that all under your belt. We also had glands on this side, right? We central, the coordinating center can come out to affect the adrenal gland, which is where we've been hitting most in terms of getting out epinephrine, norepinephrine, and then affecting those muscles. And then we've been watching how, <coughs> how uh, mean arterial pressure has been affected by that. Okay, so we're really good at the moment at thinking about how mean arterial pressure is going to be affected by those effectors. So now we're gonna plug all of that information back into the system. So we need a system that can then sense those changes in pressure which is gonna send information up to the brain, which is then going to be able to turn on the, or uh, increase the SNS or increase the PNS. Okay, so that's where we're headed. You know a lot about information coming out of here already because we've been talking a lot about like how does the sympathetic nervous system affect the heart? So we talked a lot about the information coming out of there already. Now we just need to be able to make a system, complete the loop, make a system where we can actually plug mean arterial pressure information in to the coordinating center, so that then the coordinating center can then dictate what the sympathetic nervous system is going to do or what the parasympathetic nervous system is going to do, okay? So this is where we're headed today, all right? So let's then take a quick look at our sensors. I'm not going to spend too much time here, but absolutely critical in terms of closing that loop. So, one set of sensors, critical set of sensors is our high pressure baroreceptors, right? So, baroreceptors are telling us that they're measuring pressure. High pressure receptor, we've got them in the carotid arteries. Okay, so if we think about where, the where we, they're placed in the body, that tells us where we're measuring. Right, so we've got them in the carotid arteries, so we obviously are very concerned over pressure to the brain. Okay, we also have them in the aorta. We're obviously very concerned about pressure feeding the rest of the body. Okay, so we are concerned about pressure feeding the body, and in particular, what's going on at the level of the brain. Okay, so these, Pressure sensors then are really just going to transduce, these sensors are gonna transduce a change in pressure into a change in action potential, frequency or pattern, okay? That's the only way we can sense anything. We can only sense things that we can change into a change in membrane potential or a change in action potential. If we can't do that, then we can't sense it. Okay, so these sensors are going to transduce um, a physical pressure change, right, which could just be stretch, right, because pressure in these vessels is going to stretch these vessels. So it could be a pressure stimulus that's then going to change the action potential frequency or pattern in a nerve. And that's the only way to get information into here. All right, so no big surprise we can look at the relationship between blood pressure and number of impulses from, uh, what is it, the carotid sinus in this particular example. Okay, so if that's really our action potential frequency, right? 
So the action potential frequency of the nerves that are going from that carotid sinus up into the coordinating center. That's what we're talking about here, okay? So we live um, around, well, where's that, where would 100 be around here somewhere, right? So under normal circumstances, we have a blood pressure of 100, mean arterial pressure of 100. That's what we've been regulating around. Therefore, we always have an action potential frequency coming from this sensor sense, uh, up to the brain. Okay, so this is that notion that we are never, systems are never off. Okay, they're always on. So in physiology, real critical control piece, we are always on. Maybe low, but we are always on because then there's two levels of control. We can turn it up or down. If you've got something off, all you can do is turn it on. Okay, so in the body you'll find nerves always behave this way. Um, enzymes will behave this way. They're always partly on so that you can either turn them up or down. So you've got two levels of control. So indeed, the same is true for this sensor. We, uh, at 100 millimeters of mercury pressure, So we live here on a good day. And then obviously this graph would, let, would tell us that if our mean arterial pressure went up, so in all of those examples where we were playing with mean arterial pressure and we saw it go up, this sensor would have sensed that and increased its action potential frequency to the control center. Okay, in very specific spots in the brain and we'll talk about those in a minute. And conversely, a drop in blood pressure will lead to a decrease in action potential frequency, all right? So this is, a, uh, this is an interesting sensor in that it is slowly adapting. This is, not, this is not great, but it is what it is. So it will adapt over days. And by slowly adapting, that means that if your blood pressure, let's say, were to go up for days, let's say your blood pressure were to go up to 120 to 100, or on average, mean arterial pressure goes up to 130 for a couple of days, okay? So suddenly you're in a high blood pressure situation. Then this sensor will just adapt and say, oh, 130 seems to be normal now, so we're just gonna regulate around that, okay? So what will happen is this entire relationship can shift one way or the other. So that now, if your blood pressure is uh, high for a couple of days, it will start saying, all right, we're gonna regulate around that. And that's gonna be our normal action potential frequency. So now when your blood pressure drops to normal, your body reacts in a way to bring it back up. So now your body starts regulating around a blood pressure of 130, which is not great. Okay, so if you want your blood pressure to come back down again, you gotta bring it down for a couple of days and have this sensor shift back, okay? So interesting little characteristic about this sensor. So it's really not great for long-term regulation. So I mean, we, we regulate with it all the time, but Indeed, if you're going to change your blood pressure for days or weeks, it will, it will shift. But in a healthy scenario, we will be regulating around 100 millimeters of mercury pressure with a certain action potential frequency and flux from there, okay? So where do these action potentials go? These action potentials head up into, on that, on that uh, previous graph, we talked about the coordinating center, so that was our thalamus and our um, brain stem, in particular, in particular our medulla here. So we have an increase, uh, so our action potential frequency um, would, be, would be sensed by very specific areas. So we're gonna throw out a couple of areas here vasoconstrictor center, so that's just really a group of nuclei that look like they control vasoconstriction on the way out, 
All right, so that's on our, car our coordinating center down to the effector side. Center that looks like it controls the heart, and then in fact, a center that looks like if we tap into that center, we speed the heart up. Another center, if we tap into that center, we slow the thing down. And these centers are really just groups of neurons, right? So we have these projections from our sensor, synapsing on to another group of neurons. We're going to change their accidental frequency and pattern and then send information out to um, effectors, okay? So we've got, we can inhibit, if we had an increase in action potential frequency, and so this would be from, an increase in action potential frequency from these sensors would be from an increase in mean arterial pressure, right? That's just reading off the graph. We would inhibit the vasoconstrictor center and the cardio accelerator center, Car stimulate the cardio decelerator center, and indeed, these things are doing what they say that they look like they're doing, right? So it would make sense that if I had an increase in mean arterial pressure, we would want the heart to decrease heart rate, decrease contractility. Okay, so we would inhibit accelerating it, stimulate decelerating it, okay? But these centers aren't meticulously mapped out, okay? So that's why they're kind of just called global centers and they're given these names because we can kind of map that it goes into this area, right? So all I'm, all I'm really pointing out here is, is that yes, projections from these sensors go into that coordinating center, they go into that brain stem. And what they're gonna change then is sympathetic nervous system output, parasympathetic nervous system output, okay? So we're coming into here with a change in action potential frequency and pattern. And then we're going to work synapsing in there somewhere. So that's all what, what, that these sensors are talking about. And they're going to change the action potential frequency and pattern of the sympathetic nervous system or the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay? So that's all we're tapping into when we tap into these centers. We also tap in, so those are places that we, uh, because we're tapping into the SNS and PNS, we've, uh, we've met those areas before. One area that we haven't met in this course, you've met it in the other uh, Human Phys 1, is we come into the brain stem and then uh, excite a nerve, which is then going to head off into the hypothalamus. Okay, so now we've got a couple of nerves involved. So we come into this brain stem, Simulate a cell that heads off into the hypothalamus. So we've got another, a set of hypothal hypothalamic nuclei, and they're going to control ADH vasopressin secretion. Okay, so you met this hormone back in human phys one, and we will talk a lot about this hormone when it becomes important for us to see where it's working. Okay, so I'm just going to plant this idea here. This is the second time we've planted ADH, but we will we will talk about it. Okay, so real quick then, if we were to do an example like if I were to increase my mean arterial pressure, just like we came off of on that last paper, I would increase my action potential frequency. From those baroreceptors all right, so we're going to stretch those baroreceptors. We're going to change the reaction potential frequency. Those nerves are then going to s send information uh, to the brain stem. So we're going to send information to the brain stem. So we're going to synapse onto those centers. Okay, and then those sensor, uh, those centers are then going to change output from the brain, okay? Output to those effectors. So a result of this would be to decrease the sympathetic nervous system activity and increase the parasympathetic nervous system activity, okay? So that's on the output side. So now we've got SNS and PNS changing as they head uh, to effectors, okay? So now you have to think about, okay, well, what were we plugged into with the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system, because that's then what is going to be altered, okay? So 
We know we were plugged into the heart with the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system, right? And very specifically, uh, nodal cells or the SA node. Okay, and if I had a decrease in sympathetic nervous system and an increase in the parasympathetic nervous system stimulation of these cells, <coughs> we would decrease heart rate. That would decrease uh, contractility through staircase or the trap phenomenon. This is going to least lead to a decrease in stroke volume, decrease in cardiac output, and a decrease in mean arterial pressure. <clears throat> okay, so there's the loop. We've just whipped through that feedback loop. Sensors sense to change, sense to drop, sense an increase, sent that information to the brain stem, changed SNS and PNS coming out to different effectors, the heart, to drop mean arterial pressure, okay? So this is that feedback loop, right? We also know that we would come to, uh, we, we have sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system innervation into the ventricular myocytes. Which is gonna decrease contractility, so we're gonna we're going to go through that argument again, decrease contractility, <coughs> decrease stroke volume, decrease cardiac output, decrease mean arterial pressure. Okay, we also went to blood vessels. Okay, if we went to arterioles. What would a decreased SNS to arterioles do? Any thoughts there? Yeah. It'd be vasodilate, perfect. So our, if we had uh, arterioles, we're talking about a decreased SNS. Here we would cause vasodilation. Right, and if we vasodilated a lot of vascular beds, right, not just one, we're gonna vasodilate a lot of them, this is gonna represent a decrease in total peripheral resistance, which is going to decrease mean arterial pressure. Okay, so you can see the body working towards a goal here, right? Giving all of its tools out to defend mean arterial pressure. We could also go to the veins. Sympathetic, de uh, sympathetic nervous system uh, innervated. The venous side, we talked about venoconstriction or venodilation, okay? So venodilation, now remember this wasn't going to then cause a spot resistance like it did with arterioles. This was gonna take a whole compartment, full venous compartment and change its pressure volume relationship, right? So we venodilate, we're gonna make the system much more elastic, right? So for the same volume, pressure will drop because it's much more elastic now, okay? So for the, if for the same pressure, or for the same volume, pressure would drop in the veins. That's a decrease in mean circulatory filling pressure. Okay, so that's why we do this maneuver. So drop in mean circulatory filling pressure. If we go back to our cardiovascular mechanics examples, we'd see that that would mean a decrease in venous return decrease in cardiac output of the right heart, which will then lead through multiple steps to decrease in cardiac output of the left heart and decrease mean arterial pressure. Okay, so everything that we plugged into is now helping us with this heightened mean arterial pressure problem. 
And then the last maneuver, what did we do? We went into the hypothalamic nuclei uh, and ADH vasopressin. What happened there? Why did we do that? Um, with an increase in immune arterial pressure and an increase in action potential frequency to the hypothalamic nuclei, we would decrease ADH. So what we've known about ADH so far is ADH is a vasoconstrictor, right? So we planted that idea back when we thought about arterioles. ADH is a vasoconstrictor, so we've just decreased the amount of a vasoconstrictor. So um, you remember smooth mu the effect on smooth muscle would be a sum of the constrictors and a sum of the dilators. If I just drop a constrictor, I will then cause vasodilation. I'm going to drop that vasoconstrictor. So I'm going to vasodilate. This, in essence, then is going to help us with a total peripheral resistance drop and a drop in mean arterial pressure. Okay, so we're getting the hormones out now. <coughs> What we will find out in a couple of days is that this ADH also acts on the kidney, right? So I'm going to plant this idea here, and we will circle back to this. I'm just going to write it down for now. We're going to increase water loss. So very powerful tool. We go to the kidney and increase water loss. That water loss is coming from the blood compartment. It's a filtered water. Okay, so if I can increase excretion of volume out of the body, then I have less volume in the body. Okay, so it's a decreased blood volume maneuver. And if you decrease blood volume everywhere, you decrease blood pressure everywhere. Okay, we saw that with our cardiovascular mechanics. So another long-term fix for, to decrease mean arterial pressure. All right, so you can see how the body is working in concert with, all, with a lot of different tools to, in the face of an increased mean arterial pressure, we're going to drop it. So one thing that we're going to add right now to this type of, to this type of discussion is time. Okay, so anything that's happening just totally nervously, right? We have a nervous system put in there um, so that things can happen very quickly. So all the things, all the places where we are plugged into the system with a nerve, right? SNS, innervation to nodal cells, we can do that maneuver in milliseconds to seconds, okay? So these changes are all on a milliseconds to seconds time scale. So the millisecond mean arterial pressure starts to drop is the millisecond the body starts to recover it, okay? We don't let it fall to whatever it's going to fall to and then work to fix it. The moment it starts to fall is the moment the body starts to work to fix it because we have this whole wire system layered in in order to be able to react on a millisecond to seconds time scale. Now we also have hormones which act on a seconds to minutes time scale so this example here of our ADH vasopressin acting as a hormone. So why does it take longer? We've got to secrete the hormone. It's got to get into the bloodstream. It's got to circulate around. It's got to find its membrane receptor population, and it's going to do its thing. Okay, that just takes time. Right? So we have this hormonal system seated in there so that it's almost like a second line of attack. On a, mil on a seconds to minutes time scale, we can also get the same, we can also get regulation of our mean arterial pressure. And then, in particular, whenever we go to the kidney to solve a problem, the kidney has to, and we will see why, the kidney takes longer to solve problems. Right? So the kidney will solve problems over hours to days. Right? So we're using the same hormones. This gets a bit confusing, right? You'll say, well, Coral, that's a hormone, so it should be seconds to minutes, which is true. 
If we signal um, the hypothalamic nuclei, we get ADH released into the blood. It finds its membrane receptor population on smooth muscle, okay? Then it can act right away. If it finds its membrane receptor on the kidney, it has to change a lot of things about the kidney in order to change water loss. So that is going to take time. So not, it's not that the hormone took longer to get there, it's just the effect of the hormone was longer. So anything that happens at the level of the kidney, we're going to peg as at hours to days fixed to the problem, okay? We will continue to hammer away on what these time scales mean and why they're important. Okay? All right, so that, those are our high pressure baroreceptors. Okay, high pressure, they're called high pressure because they're sitting on the high pressure side of things, aren't they? They're sitting right after the left ventricle. So they're measuring what our highest pressures in the body will be, right? So these are measuring those fluxes between 120 and 80 because we're right on the other side of the left ventricle, which is producing our highest pressure. So that's why they're called high pressure baroreceptors. They're sitting on the high pressure side of the body. Different than our low pressure baroreceptors. <coughs> our low pressure baroreceptors which are sitting now on the low pressure side of things. They're sitting over in the right atria and the pulmonary artery. Okay, so they're measuring the very lowest pressures that the body has. So these are called cardiopulmonary baroreceptors. We'll find them in the right atria and the pulmonary artery. So over on the low pressure side of things. This, uh, this graph I don't think is the right one. We will just construct one ourselves. It'll look exactly the same, but I don't like that one. So now because we're on the low pressure side of things, we don't really, uh, pressure is not really, okay, this is a fine distinction, but pressure is uh, really only a result of the volume that's there, right? And not because of a pump that's working. So you see the difference on the high pressure side of things? You got a pump plus the volume, so you're measuring these really high pressures. On the low pressure side of things, you're really measuring pressure only because the of the volume that's present, not anything to do with pump function. So you'll often see um, or read that these are often called volume sensors. They are not. They are still pressure sensors and stretch sensors. It's just that we're measuring them on the low side of things where we are only measuring pressure as a result of volume. So as a, if we look at the relationship between, let's say, blood volume and the action potential frequency from the sensor, okay, we get a relationship that looks something like this. We, are, we live right in the center. Right, it's really critical to find out where normal is. Right, we live right in the steep part of this thing, which means we are quite sensitive. So we can, changes in volume up or down then will result in a change in action potential frequency from the sensor. So for about a 10% change in volume, uh, equals a 50% change in action potential frequency. And we've been running through scenarios already where we've been changing blood volume whenever we did fluid flux, right? Whenever we fluxed fluid from the capillaries into the tissue, we were dropping blood volume. Right? And then as the blood volume in the system would drop, these sensors would then sense that. We were increasing blood volume as, as well when we were fluxing fluid from the tissue into the um, capillary space. 
We were putting volume from the tissue into the blood compartment, increasing blood volume. So we've been messing with blood volume, uh, changing blood volume already. And very similarly then, this actual potential frequency from the sensor will head up into um, a region that, they're gonna, that they call the cardiovascular control center. That cardiovascular control center will house the cardio accelerator, cardio decelerator, vasoconstrictor centers that we talked about in the high pressure baroreceptors. They're just not, this, the low pressure baroreceptors just aren't as well mapped. So we don't know the exact center they go into, so we just say, let's call all those centers part of a bigger center, and these projections go in there. Okay, so lots of work. Get to grad school, figure out where these things are going. And they're going to change things in a very similar way because they're, measure, uh, because they're also monitoring or helping us monitor mean arterial pressure. They're going to react in the very same way as high pressure baroreceptors. They're going to change the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system, okay? Just like the little exercise we just did. So coming out of the cardiovascular control center is a change in SNS and PNS, okay? So also coming out, uh, or we come into that brain stem and then we have um, neurons heading off to the hypothalamus to change um, vasopressin, ADH vasopressin secretion, okay? So we're gonna come, we're gonna meet these guys again. <coughs> okay, so that's really all I've got to say about the sensors, so we've got the system plugged in we will start to put the whole system together once we add the last piece of the puzzle, which we've started to talk about already, the level of the kidney, okay? So I wanna just put us back, get us thinking about where we've been and why we've been talking about things and how they relate to the big picture and let you know where we're headed and why we're headed there, okay? So. Jumping off of the relationship that mean arterial pressure equals cardiac output times total peripheral resistance. And you know that cardiac output, we can bust that out into, is, was um, related to uh, heart rate times stroke volume. And then we could bust stroke volume out into end diastolic volume and end systolic volume. Okay, so these two equations are exactly the same thing with all of the controllable variables laid out for you, okay? So there's nothing magical that you can add to this when we wanna change mean arterial pressure. These are the only variables we can go to. Okay, so this is why we've been talking about all the variables we have been, because they've been affecting mean arterial pressure. So for instance, you saw um, how you could affect heart rate through the SNS, the PNS, and the endocrine system. Okay, so you know all about how that works. You saw how heart rate could affect end systolic volume by changing contractility. I think we called it staircase. Or changing or trep. The trep phenomenon is the same thing. We talked about changing contractility of the heart and how that might ch how that's going to change end systolic volume. So again, we had um, sympathetic nervous system ways of doing that. Endocrine, paracrine. Right, we could also mess with end systolic volume depending on what the afterload was. So this is just a summation of where we've been and what it's been affecting. <coughs> we talked, oh, oh, heart rate, sure, also, also affected end diastolic volume, so things that is, affect end diastolic volume. Filling time and then preload, so volume in, right? So we started thinking about venous return Venous return was actually that preload. Just gonna mess with end diastolic volume. Okay. We saw in our cardiovascular mechanics exercises that we could also um, change that venous return by changing mean circulatory filling pressure. And we could mess with the sympathetic nervous system and venal constriction to do that. We could also influence preload and mean circulatory filling pressure by messing with blood volume, right? And we were doing that by fluxing fluid at the level of the capillaries. 
Okay, so that's why we were talking about capillary fluid flux, because we can mess with blood volume, which is going to change mean circulatory filling pressure. It's going to change venous return. It's going to change cardiac output and mean arterial pressure. Okay, so this is how they're all related. We talked about total peripheral resistance and mostly how uh, when we changed radius <coughs> through many different ways, autocrine, paracrine, endocrine, neural ways of changing radius. We talked about autoregulation, that myogenic response, changing radius. So every time we change radius of a large number of vascular beds, we're talking about changing total peripheral resistance. That's going to mess with mean arterial pressure. Okay, so that's why we talked about all those things. So the one piece that we're missing at the moment is um, how the kidney can change blood volume. All right, so the last thing we need to plug in here before we get a full picture of how the body regulates mean arterial pressure is to think about how the body, how the body regulates blood volume by messing with the kidney. Okay, so that's why we're headed to the kidney next. Now we do have, uh, on a type of overlay like this, not all inputs are equal. Okay, as we, we've already, we've discussed this before in when we went over this, uh, we've gone over half of this before. Um, there are more potent regulators than others. So our most potent regulators of this system are, will be neural and hormonal regulation. Second most potent regulator will be volume regulation, so coming in and actually changing volume. And the third most potent regulator of the system is, are things that deal with pressure. And by this I mean what we've got on here is afterload. Okay, so there is a priority or a potency to the different regulators. Afterload is not an equally potent regulator as the sympathetic nervous system. Okay? All right, so. This is why we're headed to the kidney next. All right, so once we add the kidney to this, then we'll be able to bust out regulation like there's no tomorrow. Okay? So let's head off into the wild world <coughs> of the kidney. See what we got going on down here. Okay, so the kidney functions, let's just get right those. So very high level, 30,000 foot view of what the kidney is doing. Well, the kidney functions to clear plasma of unwanted substances. Okay, so it is a filter. All right, so one of its primary, <coughs> primary jobs is to filter. And the second is to regulate volume. We won't be dealing too much with it as a filter in terms of its filter function. That's what the organ, just what the organ is set up to do. We will look at it as a volume regulator. Renal blood flow, the thing that allows it to be a potent volume regulator is because renal blood flow is approximately 1.2 liters per minute. Okay, so think about that number for just a moment. 
We have 5.5 liters of blood per minute circulating. 1.2 liters of that is headed to two kidneys. Okay, so a fifth of all of your blood volume, remember we said we're, we're putting 5.5 liters out of the left heart to go to 600 vascular beds? Well, it is not going to them equally. In fact, a fifth of that volume is headed straight to the kidney. This is why it's such a powerful volume regulator, because we send so much volume there. We send a fifth of our blood every minute headed off to those kidneys. They are working hard. Okay? So a fifth of our blood is going there, therefore we have a lot of potential to lose a fifth of our blood in any given minute, or try to keep as much of that fifth of our blood as we possibly can, okay? <clears throat> so what's important about like, the functional anatomy here, in terms of how it might actually be doing this, we have two layers that are important. So this is a cross-section of the kidney here. We've got some blood vessels going in, and we'll talk about those in a minute. But really critical is, is these two layers. There's this outer layer and this inner layer. These are functionally important. This outer layer is the cortex. And this inner layer that we will constantly be referring to is uh, uh, the medulla. Those two are, there's a very different um, environment built in, two, in both of those different areas. Okay, and those environments are going to actually make the kidney function. Okay, so there's a very different environment out in the cortex versus the environment that's built in the medullary space, but we will talk about that as we go. So really important now is that you know that we've got these two spots that we're going to be working with. So the functional unit of the, uh, of the kidney is uh, the nephron. Okay, so the functional unit is the nephron and its associated vasculature. Okay, so if we look at the nephron itself, it's this blind-ended tube that starts at the Bowman's capsule. So here, we st the, the, the tube, the nephron tube, starts at, at a uh, Bowman's capsule, and then uh, the tube changes to a proximal tubule. Okay, so that has very different characteristics. The proximal tubule then heads down into what's called the loop of Henle. The loop of Henle will dip down and then dip back up. That's very functionally important. We'll get to that. And then uh, the tube changes dramatically, so we'll give it a different name. Then it heads off into the distal tubule. And then many distal tubules collect, one, two, three, four, five, into uh, the collect, oh, that's not the collecting duct. The collecting duct is here. Multiple distal tubules from multiple nephrons collect in a collecting duct. Okay, this collecting duct then will head out to the ureter. Okay, just another tube to the bladder, which is really just a holding tank. And then from there, it's, uh, it can be out of the body. Uh, and what we would call excretion. Essentially, if you can get something out into the ureter, it's as good as gone, okay? There's no way to reclaim anything once it's gone into the ureter, okay? If it's into the ureter, 
That's just a passage. It's just a transport tube to the bladder, which is just a holding tank. Okay, there's no way to recover anything once it's out, um, once it's out into the ureter. We do have some ability to uh, to reclaim as we go along in this tube, but those are very those are longer conversations that we will get to. All right, so we've got that tube laid in there, and surrounding that tube then is a very special vasculature. Okay, so if we think about where is our, we got, okay, so we start in here with our arcuate artery. Uh, I should label these, so A, our arcuate artery coming into, uh, so artery, right, so it's for transport. And then we have an, uh, our arteriolar level, an afferent arteriole. And then we have this glomerular <coughs> capillary bed, so the glomerulus is really just the capillary bed at the level of the kidney. We give it a special name. Okay, so, so far everything looks pretty normal. We've got an artery, we've got an arterial, we have a capillary bed. This, is a, this um, vasculature is a little odd in that now it has another set of arterioles. Okay, this is one of the only vascular, this is one of the only tissues that does this. We have another set of arterioles, so right here. Efferent arterioles. So we have afferent arterioles, a capillary bed, and efferent arterioles. So already you can see, if, I, if you think about it, I've got a afferent arterioles, a capillary bed, and efferent arterioles. Both of these arterioles can constrict and dilate. I'm going to have wicked control over volume in and volume out. Okay, volume into capillary beds, we always talked about what the resistance was. But now the downstream volume out of is going to be dictated by what efferent resistance is. So we are going to have wild control over pressure in this glomerulus. Wild control over capillary pressure here. Okay, and that's what helps us with filtering more. But again, we'll talk about that in a minute. So where were we? Artery, afferent arterial, glomerulus, efferent arterial, then downstream of that efferent arterial, another capillary bed. And this capillary bed, very specifically, is wrapped all around the, um, all around the tube, all around the different parts of the tubule. Okay, all around the distal tubule, the loop of Henle, the proximal tubule. And these are called paratubular capillaries. Then downstream of that is a vein. Okay, so normally capillary or normal vascular beds have artery, arterial, capillary, vein. That's our normal setup. This one has two capillary beds in series. Yep. The things that label with letters are blood flowing through, yes. So the things that are numbered is the nephron itself, and that'll be what we filter. Okay, so we're going to now filter at that glomerulus. We're going to filter from the bloodstream into the tubule. So what is in the numbered tubes, the nephron is going to be stuff we filtered from the blood. Okay? And letters, that's our bloodstream. Right, and so this bloodstream in particular has two capillary beds in series with each other. This is odd, okay? This is an exceptional capillary bed. So this one, this vasculature, we have artery, arteriole, capillary, arteriole, capillary, vein is what we've got going on here, okay? All right, so let's take a... Uh, well, let's take a quick break and then we'll focus in on that nephron. <coughs> Let me speed that up. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's get back at it. 
Okay, so let's go think about those nephrons for a minute. So we have two types of nephrons. And really the distinction is that loop of Henle, that part of the tube, where the loop of Henle lies. Okay, so we have cortical nephrons where all of the parts of the nephron are out in that cortex area. So you remember we talked about that cortex space and the medullary space? Okay, so the cortical nephron will have all parts of the nephron in the cortex. We have juxtamedullary nephrons where the loop of Henle dips way down into that medullary space and then loops way back up to the cortex. Okay. So the juxtamedullary nephrons have that loop of Henle. In the medullary space. Okay, so we've got our Bowman's capsule, proximal tubule, which leads to the loop of Henle dipping way down and then wave and then back up into the cortex to where we'll find the distal tubule and then the collecting duct. We, collect, we um, converge onto a collecting duct that then the collecting duct also heads way down into that medullary space. Okay, so if we think about um, <coughs> think about that original picture where we talked about the two, uh, the cortex being the outer, medullary space inner, so here's the cortex, right, and they've got this kind of dividing line here, cortex here, medullary space here. So really critical for a function of uh, fluid flux or moving uh, volume is that this loop of Henle dips way down into this medullary space and this collecting duct dips way down into the medullary space, right? So we will, in a little bit, get to what is going on in that medullary space because that's very critical, that environment, okay? The cortical nephrons are where we do a lot of just our filtering function, right? So when we're thinking about volume regulation, we are thinking about juxtamedullary nephrons. So just so you know, whenever we're having a conversation about um, fluid flux or volume regulation at the level of the kidney, we are talking about juxtamedullary nephrons. The other function of just being a filter, juxtamedullary nephrons can do it, but cortical, that's what uh, cortical nephrons are really good at. Okay, just the filter function, clearing our blood of unwanted substances. Okay. All right. So, first of all, so we need to focus in on the the two components to the functional unit. We need to think about the vasculature, and we need to think about the nephron as a tube. Okay. So we're going to separate that into two discussions. First, we'll think about the vasculature because we're really good at thinking about the vasculature based on what we've just been talking about for the last couple of days, right? And then we'll segue into um, the nephron itself, that tube. Okay. So let's start by thinking about the vasculature. So that was that weird set of capillaries in series with each other. So let's start thinking about the vasculature. Right? You guys are on top of this already. All right. So essentially, we have, if we're a cortical nephron, versus a juxtamedullary nephron, We have the renal artery coming in, and let's say we're a cortical nephron, so the one that's up in that medullary space, uh, up in the cortical uh, space. <coughs> we have afferent arterioles, 
Okay, we've got the artery, the afferent arterial, so that's a spot where we can put in resistance into the system. We have a uh, glomerulus. This is our capillary bed. Just a fancy name. Glomerulus is a fancy name for capillary bed, specifically for the kidney. And then downstream of that capillary bed, we have another set of arterioles, efferent arterioles. And then we lead to that paratubular capillary bed that's all wound around the, uh, the tube of the nephron itself. All right, so this is another capillary bed. And then we converge into the venules and then back to the body. All right, then we, uh, so on the juxtamedullary side, on the juxtamedullary nephron, we will have uh, afferent arterioles before the juxtamedullary glomerulus or capillary bed, and then efferent arterioles downstream of that to paratubular capillaries. It's another capillary bed. And then there's a special component of this paratubular capillary bed that follows that um, loop of Henle all the way down into that medullary space. So this part of the, um, as, as the loop of Henle dips way down into that medullary space, there's part of that paratubular capillary bed that follows it. Okay, so that capillary uh, bed dips way down into the medullary space as well, and they give that a special name. They're gonna call it the vasorecta. Okay, but again, that's just part of the paratubular capillary bed that heads down into that medullary space following the um, loop of Henle, okay? They are both downstream of those efferent arterioles. There aren't efferent arterioles that control each one of them, okay? They're both, these are all part of the same thing, except one piece dips way down into the medullary space. Okay, so in terms of then controlling, so the capillary bed of, uh, at the level of the kidney, right? So the Bowman's capsule, which is the start of the tube of the nephron, is tucked around the, gl uh, the glomerulus, the glomeruli, the capillary beds, right? So that's where this filtration is occurring. Okay, so we've used the word filtration before in moving, in moving volume from capillaries to the interstitial space. Here we're gonna be moving volume from the capillaries into the Bowman's capsule, so into the nephron tube, okay? So we're not putting it into a tissue space this time, like you did with muscle, we're putting it into another tube, okay? So we're gonna be filtering and reabsorbing, okay? So we're going, that then should, Make the little hair stand up on the back of your neck, right? Because we're gonna be talking about capillary pressure, Bowman's capsule pressure, osmotic pressure in the, um, the blood, osmotic pressure in the Bowman's capsule. Okay, so those same um, uh, forces are gonna come at play here. So one of those forces, really critical, just like any of our other capillary beds was what is pressure in the capillary, right? Because if we change pressure in the capillary, we can change filtration a lot. And so here, because of the fact that we have two arterioles, the one, one um, above the capillary bed and one below, we're going to have wicked control over pr volume in that capillary and pressure in that capillary. Okay, so when we, when we make it look like, when we model it, kind of like the way we've been modeling volume in, volume out compartments. Okay, if we think about what we've just built here, kind of looks a little bit like this, where we have um, mean arterial pressure influencing volume into the glomerular capillary bed. Okay, and we had afferent arterioles upstream of that glomerular capillary bed. All right, so now we have, that's pretty common, right? Resistance and pressure will affect volume into the glomerular capillary bed. So all those arguments are 
uh, ones that you've seen before. Volume out of, though, a little bit weird, is going to be affected by another set of resistance arterioles, efferent arterioles. Downstream of the efferent arterioles, we have the paratubular capillary bed, so they will also have a vol their own volume in argument based on what efferent arterioles are doing. And then, of course, their volume out argument will be dictated by mean circulatory filling pressure. Okay. So, like any of our other volume in, volume out arguments, if we're thinking about that glomerular capillary bed, which is where we are going to filter blood volume into the nephron, so we're going to filter blood volume into another tube system here. Okay, let's go through a couple of examples. If I were to vaso constrict afferents. Vasoconstrict afferents, so we're talking about vasoconstriction here. We're increasing resistance for flow into the capillary bed. Okay, so we're going to decrease volume into the glomerular capillary bed. Therefore, we're going to decrease volume in the capillary bed or in the glomerulus. Decrease pressure in that capillary bed. And here we start to use special, or we're starting to use special language, special kidney language. Capillary equals glomerulus, so we will, you'll see pressure. When we're talking about pressure in the capillary, if that capillary is the glomerulus, we will see it written as PG instead of PC. It's the same thing, though. We just called it a different name. Okay? So we change pressure in the glomerulus. And the opposite would be true if we were to vasodilate those afferents. So make sure you run through that argument and you get it. Okay? So what about vasoconstriction of efferents? Think about vasoconstriction of efferents. Can someone take me through that? What's going to happen if we vasoconstrict efferents? Okay, that's vasoconstriction now downstream of that capillary, of that glomerulus. So what's going on with PG? Someone take me through that argument. Increase resistance here, good, yes? Decrease volume out of, yep. So increase in volume in, increase, yeah, perfect, all right. So if we decrease the volume out of the glomerulus, therefore we're gonna increase volume in the glomerulus, okay? which is going to result in an increase in PG. Okay, so when we're changing pressures here, though, be clear on what we're, what, where we'll be heading. When we change pressure in that glomerulus, we will be changing filtration, right? And we're talking about fil filtering volume, blood volume, into another set of tubes. Okay, so we're taking blood volume out of the capillary space and putting it into another tubular system. If we leave it in that tubular system and excrete it out, it's gone. Okay, so we have huge power here to change pressure in the glomerulus, change filtration, and lose volume from the body. Okay, massive power here. Whenever we, and that's a little bit different, though, I guess the reason I bring up power is because when we flux fluid into the tissue, remember when we changed capillary pressure and we put fluid into, a, into our tissues? It was still here. We didn't lose it to the body, did we? It was still here, and if pressure changed back, we could flux it back, right? So it was, so tissues became storage for fluid. We could put it on and take it off, right? But if we lose it from the body, it is gone, okay? So huge power here. 
All right, so what would happen if I were to vasoconstrict afferents and efferents equally? What's going to happen there? So vasoconstrict equally. Someone think about what would happen with pressure in the glomerulus there. Decrease both equally. Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah. Pressure of the glomerulus would stay the same. Perfect, because our volume, uh, let's, before we jump to that, that would mean uh, if we vasoconstrict our afferents, we're decreasing volume into the glomerulus, but vasoconstricting afferents will decrease volume out of, right? Indeed, we would end up, therefore, with no change No change in pressure in the glomerulus. Critical, though, we can do this. Uh, this maneuver will not change pressure in the glomerulus, so we're not going to change how much we filter. But if we do this maneuver, we will drop blood flow to the kidneys altogether, won't we? We've just increased resistance to the kidneys, and so now blood flow is being, is being shunted to somewhere else, right? So critical to this maneuver is we have the ability to change pressure in the glomerulus depending on whether we mess with efferents or afferents, but we also have the ability to, to not change pressure in the glomerulus but change renal blood flow. So this is a maneuver where the body, if the body is low in mean arterial pressure, we're just, we're just going to clamp down. We're just going to not send blood to the kidney because we have a potential to lose it there. So let's just not send it there, right? But then we have to clamp down both equally. So filtration stays normal, but blood flow will be diverted elsewhere. So this maneuver will help us not change pressure in the glomerulus, but decrease renal blood flow. Okay, so really, really critical here is we have the ability to do both. We don't always have to change pressure in the glomerulus if we want to divert blood flow away from the kidney. Okay. Okay, we will mess with fluid flux Thursday. <laughs>